you very much, Andrew. As I said earlier, we'll take, um, Andrew's happy to take some questions. If you would like to ask a question, could you just raise your hand, please, so that a microphone can be brought to you, so that it can be captured for posterity. Greg, I'm going to just kick off with a question while the microphone oh, sure. is making, uh, making its way to uh, Greg Mellish at the back. Uh, Andrew, you've talked about um, the stresses that are placed upon tradition, and in some ways you've characterised that as a, as a stress that's been imposed by a tug from two different directions. Yeah. To what extent do you think tradition as uh, that which puts um, important limits on behaviour and practice, to what extent do you think tradition is under threat from the growth of individualism? Oh, right. Well, yes, this is very, this is very good. I should have raised this. Um, there's a very interesting uh, book that has just come out by the American scholar E.J. Dionne. And uh, E.J. Dionne is probably on the left side of American politics, yet he's spent most of his career trying to breach that gap between conservatives, conservatism and liberalism. And he argues that American society, and he argued this was uh, you know, evident in the most recent presidential race, was a contest between communitarianism and individualism. And I'm inclined to believe uh, to agree with him in this sense that if you that this is that the the communitarian ethos is something that crosses left and right. If you look in Australia, for example, the best critique, the best political critique that I ever heard came from Archbishop Peter Jensen, uh, the Anglican Archbishop of Sydney, when I interviewed him for the monthly uh, six seven years ago. It was a cover story, and I asked him about this all-powerful group in the electorate called the Aspirationals. And I asked him what he meant. What, it, you know, what did he think that meant? You know, what were, and he said, look, the greatest aspiration of the aspirational class was to have a fulfilling family and community life. And Peter Jensen has really you know, staked his reputation, staked his name on this battle against what he says is, well, he's used the phrase, the invidious the invidious culture of individualism. So this is a this is a you know he has really redefined politics as a battle between communitarianism and individualism. Now of course that's not a battle by the way Peter which I'm sure people will want to talk about in favor of statism uh, but it is a but it is an argument in favor of not a, not so much a collective ethos but an ethos of mutual obligation. So Yes, I do think the tradition is very much under threat from individualism because by its very nature, individualism insists that I really have no obligation to honour the practices of my forebears. I don't really have a, an obligation to honour the customs of my community because they somehow infringe on my ability to do what I like. Yeah. Great. Can I stand? Or? Thanks. Ah. Oh, thanks very much for that. Um, when I looked across your, across your three areas and thought about tradition, I then came to think about the two buzzwords of today, one of which is innovation yeah. and the other one which is relevance. Now, if we look at the case of the Anglican Church, they may do with the same prayer book for 300 years and yet in 30 years they've had two. Uh, possibly they'll be going for one every 10 <laughs> years in the future on the assumption that it constantly has to be updated to be to be relevant because the language is no longer to be able to be understood, etc. The same certainly applies in higher education. Higher education, innovation and relevance are seen as the two things universities do, not traditional scholarship. So everything, knowledge has to be constantly made relevant. So knowledge that's more than a certain number of years is out of date, so it's tradition. It's it's, and maybe the same works in politics. Maybe it's innovation has got hold of politics, relevance has got hold of politics. So in that case, you throw tradition to the back, because um, they're the things that that matter. So tradition seems to me to be in constant battle at the moment, particularly with the the innovation fetish, and with the rel relevance fetish as well. Well, that is the inconsistency, uh, uh, Professor, about about the, uh, uh, I think, something of an inconsistency on the part of uh, church modernisers. Because we're constantly told, and, uh, and I agree with this, that the church ought to be um, countercultural. It ought to be countercultural on the economics. It ought to be countercultural on certain social movements. And yet, if really, when it comes to 
the beauty, the tradition of the church, you've, you've got to be with the zeitgeist. And I do find that somewhat inconsistent, um, you know, that, we're, that, that the church is to stand against fashion in so many other areas. But in the area that gives it its visible unity, the idea that you could walk into a Church of England in India or in London or in Sydney and you'd all have a prayer book that would be roughly the same, that you'd all recite the Nicene Creed, the Confession, the Prayer of Humble Access, the Lord's Prayer, that you'd all go through a similar litany of prayer. This is considered um, often not... You're right, it's considered often not socially relevant. And yet it's, the tr it's that visible form of Anglicanism that binds the church together. So yes, I, ex I think you've absolutely put your, your finger on it. The notion of innovation with you know, very little intellectual depth behind it, I think is quite corrosive in those three areas. Uh, yes, you've talked about uh, religion and also about uh, interrelationships of uh, faith and so forth. Australia is basically a Judeo-Christian uh, society. Obviously, it would limit other religions um, in, in certain ways um, because it's based on the seven uh, uh, Nordish laws, basically, thou shalt not kill. It's basically like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal and so forth. Because in Australia, we wouldn't allow any religion come in, for example, with the tribal religions or so from South, from New Guinea or uh, South America, like cannibalism or human sacrifice. That would be unacceptable in Australia because of the tradition of our Judeo-Christian society. My question is then, uh, shouldn't we be resorting back to the core traditions of the Nordish laws? The, the laws given by Noah to Noah by God, uh, which is then, which is family, faith, neighbourhood, and individual freedom and the course of laws. Thank you. Uh, well, y yes, but I think we already do. I mean, our laws. I think. Are, I mean, I take your point, but I think we already do uh, observe those basic canons in our law. Um, I'm all for religious pluralism, by the way. My point about tradition in the Anglican Church and the Christian churches generally is that one can live in a pluralistic society and strongly defend one's doctrines. One doesn't have to comp compromise one's core doctrines, which is the critique that's been made of the Episcopal Church in America. Uh, you can still, you, one doesn't have to compromise those core doctrines to live in a pluralist society. I, you make a good point, sir, but I, I don't actually think we're living by rules anything that are guided by anything other than that canon, not basic rules. Can I just seem to, oh, sure. object to say that we've got a question via um, Twitter, via the hashtag. If you have been following the live stream and you'd like to ask Andrew a question, you can tweet that um, at the hashtag CIS events. We've got a question from Chris Kenny. Thanks, Chris, who says that he's fascinated by the culture of public service in politics and the need for a diverse experience, but how to tackle it. Right. Well, uh, I think this is Chris Kenny, who's a columnist at the Oz, um, whose work I read and follow. Um, Chris, how to tackle it the way um, I think that some... Well, I do have one idea of how to tackle it, and that is that we abolish the politically appointed ministerial staff. Um, <laughs> Chris, Chris, Chris's... Um, the, the, the Oz uh, newspaper... Um, carried a, n a number of very good reports, a critique, I think, by uh, Jennifer Halliday, um, uh, who was a, uh, a self-a-senior public servant, talking about not so much the criminally corrupting aspect of this, but the sort of ethically corrupting aspect of having all of these huge politically appointed unaccountable ministerial staffs. Um, I think if we shrunk the number of... Uh, of uh, appointments that ministers can make to about three. Their loyal appointment secretary, someone to deal with the press, and maybe one political advisor, I think we would limit the enormous growth in political patronage that exists. Um, I think the unions, as I say, I think that unions are a critical element of, a civil, soci of civil society, but the unions, and if not voluntarily, then the law should maybe be changed. 
to require trade union leaders to have worked for a minimum of five years in the industry that they cover. And you would, you would get rid of those who use unions as places for political sinecure. Um, so, yes, I mean, I, 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 I know that uh, Chris has written about this and, um, you know, I, I've followed his writing and I, and I admire it. I can only suggest those two practical measures. Uh, if you, I mean, when Gough Whitlam's office, uh, government came to power, uh, according to uh, Rodney Cavalier's history uh, of this, people, ministers could appoint two or three ministerial staff, and that was it. I think on average it's now about 15. Well, that's an awful lot of patronage to spread around. That's an awful lot of jobs where you can warehouse aspiring politicians who don't have to go out and make their careers, as Chris Kenny did in the media, um, who, as Peter Coleman did as a newspaper editor, as people like Mal Washer, who was a surgeon, um, as the legion of people who've been doctors and lawyers, farmers, um, you know, without those, without that, that political uh, patronage, I think we could start to curb, to curb this uh, this problem. Thanks. Uh, you, what you're talking about perhaps could be accommodated by saying that uh, you can't have a career in politics within five years or something of being a staffer as well. <laughs> but my, re my real comment is uh, what you're talking about often comes back to the sort of biblical injunction in his service is perfect freedom. Uh, you have the individual role within the community obligation. And I think that then leads to a problem, particularly for a group like us here, that we don't corrupt the meaning of individualism because now it's becoming a word of criticism when I think an organisation like this needs to stand up and say we're talking about a different form of individualism, not a self selfish individualism. It's more like what I think Gladstone and Peel would have called a moral individualism, uh, one which has a moral base. And uh, I think that's what you're endorsing, but I think we just have to be very careful that we don't just say individualism is bad. Uh, because, uh, I mean, some people qualify it by saying rampant individualism or that, that sort of term. But if, if you qualify individualism to say we stand for something that has a moral base, that is, even if it's do no harm to others, that's a moral base, but it goes beyond that into what you're talking about. Well, there's one other form, though, of individualism. I think, I, I think it's yours is a very good point um, that, I do find quite, uh, that I do find quite corrosive, though. And that is the notion of statist individualism. I, for a long time, had thought, like many people, that Sweden was quite a good society. You look at its uh, public health indices, its education indices, um, uh, its generally sort of equable uh, society. And then some years ago, I began to read more deeply about Sweden. Last year, my wife and I visited Sweden, and it certainly is a country with very high quality public services. But some years ago, I began to read about the evolution in Sweden of what they call statist individualism, where one does, if not voluntarily, but generally, uh, you know, without much resistance, give up one large sums of one's income to the, to the government in exchange for very high quality services being provided. But it has completely undermined those traditional intermediary institutions in society, voluntary institutions. The BBC did a very good radio program on this many years ago, or actually, no, a few, few months ago, where they said one of the interesting things in, uh, in modern Sweden, an interesting social phenomenon, was that you um, never offer to buy anyone else dinner because it is always... So that, that small gesture of human solidarity is undermined because it's assumed that everyone else has been provided for. If someone moves in next door, don't take them uh, a customary plate of cake or other baked product because they'll assume they have an obligation to you at some point down the track. So you're quite right. I think we probably have to define individualism a bit more, uh, a bit more carefully. Uh, but that kind of statist individualism some years ago began to dawn on me as a rather, um, as a rather unwelcome byproduct of too much statism. Andrew, you, you remarked uh, uh, a couple of minutes ago uh, that the church, uh, almost in an off-the-cuff way, that a church, the church should be 
countercultural in economics. And that raises for me a, a problem that uh, uh, I think with all the churches uh, and perhaps with, with Christianity, that if there's one thing that just about everybody, uh, uh, except perhaps a few sects, uh, want, uh, it is better health services, uh, particularly, of course, for, for, for children, better education, better housing. And all of this involves wealth creation and productivity, and that's how it's happened uh, compared with earlier centuries. And yet the churches seem to have zero interest in productivity or wealth creation. And you, you, you showed that when you said that the churches should be countercultural. Yeah, but economic. I didn't say... Yeah, but Peter, I didn't necessarily say should be countercultural on one side or the other. I just said that the, the church's job as a, as a uh, prophetic voice... Uh, of, of, of critiquing whoever's in power ought to be countercultural, and I thought it was quite appropriate back in the 1980s when Archbishop Runcie was considered the bane of Mrs Thatcher's life, just like I thought I think that it's appropriate that uh, the church, uh, such as it was able to exist uh, behind the Iron Curtain, uh, spoke out from time to time, often at great personal risk, against that kind of statist oppression. I'm just saying, Peter, I, I'm just pointing out that it's, it does seem to me to, to be somewhat inconsistent to argue that the church needs to be countercultural on both economic and social matters, and yet has to be with the zeitgeist when it comes to its own forms. Um, I take your point, absolutely, but um, I, I'm not necessarily making, a, uh, making a, um, an argument that the church needs to stand for one form of economics over the other. I'm, I'm just saying that it is right for the church as a prophetic voice to be countercultural. Thanks. Two, two questions. First, we'll talk to one, then to Stephen, if I may. We've got a question from, from Greg Lindsay, who's tweeted in this question. He says, I value tradition, but innovation and entrepreneurship too. That's how we end up in modernity. Are they irreconcilable? Uh, no, of course not. <laughs> of course not. And um, I, I can't really give another answer to that to say other than uh, no, they're not, uh, they're not uh, irreconcilable. Um, at all, but we're working with, but, but tradition, as I say, imposes on us. They're only irreconcilable in this sense, that I think tradition imposes upon us a respect for our, our family, our neighbourhood and our nation. And where those, where they, where innovation, entrepreneurship, industry, those sorts of things butt up against that, I think tradition is a good check on all, on all excesses. So no, of course not. I mean, I think you know, Greg more than anyone uh, is qualified to answer that question. As I say, where 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 any behaviour butts up against, as I say, what I consider to be those three pillars: family, neighbourhood, nation, then we ought to think again. It, it is a natural check on uh, on uh, on policy, on behaviour. Um, back to religion, just for a moment. Um, when I was working in England most recently, in the last five years, and I used to drive to work and listen to Thought for the Day, um, and it became more increasingly rarer to hear any of the um, people on Thought for the Day actually have a religious thought. Um, so there would be Rabbi Blue who would tell jokes, and there would be uh, Archbishop Carey who would talk about the Brotherhood of Man, and Nobody ever mentioned God, nobody ever mentioned religion really, except for the imam, um, who was the only one who actually... Did. And then to say, well, religion has lost its influence in civil society, it's not much of a surprise, is it? Because they've lost interest in their own purpose for being, <laughs> haven't they? Um, I, and I, I got into a lot of trouble when I worked in the Daily Telegraph for saying that it would be nice to have an honest thought for the day occasionally. We <laughs> um, uh, still haven't. But and I guess a related issue is when David Cameron decided that he was going to make his slogan the big society, however vacuous that might be, it was the Archbishop of Canterbury who complained that it was simply a way of taking away the state's responsibility. And I thought that was an unusual way of putting it. Uh, yes, well, the big society, as you know, my impression was that it was fine in impulse, but it's the critique has been that it's been... Uh, the, the critique of the big society is that it was it was good in impulse and poor in execution. Um, 
uh, it was, I mean, as I understand, the notion of the big society came out of Philip Blonde, the, uh, the red Tory theologian um, who established the Res Publica think tank. And uh, Philip Blonde is a really interesting, compelling thinker um, who was urging uh, a much greater um, sense of... Uh, he's effectively a communitarian. Um, but your, your point, Stephen, is, is I think that... Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm struggling a little to... Um, the, the church no longer... Sp this is a common critique, that the church no longer speaks about God. Is that... No, I, I suppose I, you're talking about the... You're talking about civil society mm. and the encouragement of the development of people working with one another. Mm. Not rampant individualism, mm. but some way of getting the most out of civil society when the church itself isn't encouraging it. Yes, well, this is a critique. Peter Hitchens made this, uh, made this critique some uh, months ago on our program where he said that part of what the Church of England had done was relinquish its responsibility for education, uh, decided in the post-war years to hand over all education to the state. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're right there that the church, that the church has uh, has accepted the the drift to a form of statist individualism, um, rather than asserting its role as a service provider. I think, though, look, to be honest with you, in more recent years, the church has had to be very careful about um, about this identity as as an entity in civil in civil society. One, um, because anything to do with the church providing education or services to children is now clouded with this controversy over the, uh, the clerical abuse scandal. And that naturally, I think, makes many people in the church just rather reluctant to, um, to rediscover that role, that historic role that they had in education and caring for orphan children. But the second thing is, uh, churches are increasingly concerned about being compromised by a whole range of of laws and guidelines that are imposed by government, particularly those churches that receive public money um, as part of uh, either a compassionate conservative agenda, uh, as a, uh, the, the sort of agenda that George Bush and to a lesser extent John Howard tried to encourage of, uh, of outsourcing public services to churches and to church-run organisations. They tended to be organisations with a good motivation, a good impulse, but I think I, I do know that the churches became very wary about accepting public money because of all the limits uh, or because of all the rules that were imposed on them, accountability standards beyond, you know, they say accountability standards beyond simply ensuring that we don't uh, squander, uh, squander the money. So, yes, I, 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 in a roundabout way, I'll take your point that um, the churches themselves have withdrawn from social service activity, from civil society, but I think there's a couple of uh, contemporary sort of phenomena behind that. Thank you. Um, thank you for your very fascinating talk. My question concerns the language used. So liberty so often seems to refer almost exclusively to personal autonomy, and that can just be seen in the comments feed on the Acton Lecture on the ABC site. And the use of tradition can easily become just as relativistic. So why should this tradition have a privilege? You know, why Christianity not Islam? Why Islam not Christianity? So isn't there an, any more precise or deeper or more concrete terms or language that we could actually use in this discussion? I suppose we could use custom. I suppose we could use belief. Um, there are probably a lot... Well, belief is certainly more concrete than tradition. Belief implies, uh, one hopes, something that's been thought about, argued over, uh, a kind of settled... We could use doctrine. Uh, that seems to me to be too defined a word, too concrete a word, if, if you like, uh, a word that offers not enough flexibility. Um, I like the term tradition. I think that... Uh, I. I yeah, I like the term tradition. <laughs> I'm sorry I can't give you a, a deeper answer than that. Tradition, custom. I think once we get into, I think once we start talking in terms of doctrine, um, then we're really straitjacketing ourselves. Except, of course, in the Christian churches, where there is or ought to be 
a basic settled doctrine. We can argue over certain points of interpretation, but as I said, in the United States, when they're now disputing the notion of, uh, of a singular form of salvation, I do think that's rather uh, adventurous, to say the least, for a Christian church. Sure, sure. Uh, right. Uh, you've mentioned about uh, the limit of entrepreneurship. Um, uh, it has to be limited by um, the nation, work and family and, and the importance of religion. However, quite often the interpretation is the interpretation of the religion. For example, um, the, in the Bible, if it's a Christian one, is the parable of the talents. You should make as much money as possible. And the good Samaritan and, of course, give some to the poor as well. So coming to that field where there is a um, conflict between what you've mentioned before, if it's against the nation, but the, it's the interpretation of, of the um, actual tradition of the religion itself. Uh, how would you solve that problem? Thank you. Uh, well, I, um, I wouldn't. On, I'm not a theologian, but on the question of the parable of the talents, it's hugely argued over. I mean, it's some say that it is. I, I, I note that John, uh, the, back when um, Kevin Rudd was uh, opposition leader and was making, uh, starting to make a philosophical case against John Howard, I think the parable of the talents was discussed. Then John Howard did argue that it meant wise investment. And I think the other interpretation, however, was that it simply, it was a, it was a parable about using God's gifts wisely not necessarily as sort of some sort of financial indices. Um, I, I can't solve, I can only refer to both sides of that debate. I can't, I can't answer that question to your satisfaction. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Oh, no worries. <coughs> well, Andrew, thank you very much indeed. I think that your um, take on tradition in those three areas of religion and politics and higher education has been extremely uh, interesting, and I think that I'm particularly interested myself in the relationship between the between the, the between the individual and his or her relationship with the, with the traditions of society. So thank you very much for setting out some <laughs> most interesting ideas right. about that. We've been very um, uh, however unsatisfactory they were expressed. Unsatisfactorily they were expressed. <laughs> I'd like you to accept oh, as well. My pleasure. A token of our oh my pleasure. Our thank you, Andrew. Oh, thank great. you very much indeed. Oh, wonderful.